This is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 956, recorded on Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. 2024 Twiss predictions. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with looking back, looking forward, and looking here and now. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twiss. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The new year is here. The year that passed was filled with advances across the scientific field, innovations that hint at a very different future to come than the one that we may have predicted before the year began. While the new year awaits us, shrouded in a fog of uncertainty, the one that passed can now be clearly seen. So what better time to look at the last year's predictions and find out how close they came to reality. Before it is over, we will cast our gaze once more into the future and predict the year to come. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. Big kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening this week in science? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Yeah. You, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin and Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Blair, your face is so smiley right now. Justin, <laughs> yours looks like it needs more coffee. <laughs> no. <laughs> your face looks like it needs coffee. Is that what you just said? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I did. Probably Welcome back. Good to have you all back again. 2024, here we go again. Everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We have a great show ahead full of predictions. This is our show where we look back at the predictions that we made last year and see how we did at prog prognostication. And then we look at the predictions we're making for this year to come. And then we're going to talk a little bit about science and we're going to try and throw it all together in a timeline that makes sense so that Blair can stay with us for the entire show. Uh, Justin, what kind of science news are you going to be talking about later on? Oh, let's see. What have I got? Uh, the giant apes of southern China. And oh, what is the other one? There's another one. Uh, oh, yes. The rise of archery in south america maybe earlier than we thought Ooh, i've got wings and another study related to what did i put in here oh yeah supernovae and dark energy blair what did you bring for the show Just, tonight oh my goodness i brought bats with sweet teeth and misunderstood grizzly bears bats with sweet teeth oh, yeah wow. oh. Do they get more cavities? Or Great question. Just, I don't know. Okay, everyone. As we jump into the show ahead, I would love to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed, you can click that subscribe button wherever you are, and you'll get us every single week in your feed. Make sure you get notified also. Additionally, we are here as much as possible Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time, uh, live streaming our show Wednesdays. And we are on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Most of the social media accounts are at Twist Science. Our website is twist.org. And if you look for This Week in Science, you'll find us pretty much anywhere. But anyway, here we go. It's time for the science. And let us begin with our predictions from last year. How, How did we did do? We do? How did we do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say, I think I usually uh, play it fairly safe and close to the chest. So uh, anyway, I said last year, yes, 
Climate change will continue to worsen with continued drought and fires around the world brought on by shifting weather and patterns and higher land and ocean temperatures. Uh, yep. Thanks, El Nino. Uh, however, we will see continued success in the development of sustainable energy sources like solar, wind, and geo geothermal. And yeah, there's been a lot of that. Oh, there was a real advancement and some real data showing us that those sustainable energy sources are making progress, which is great. Um, and new battery technology will begin to improve electric vehicles as a choice for consumers. Also, that one okay. came, came to pass, yeah, which I not, actually, not actually, that was like a big, like, toss in it because it's been a long time for <laughs> hoping the batteries would start to get better. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will discover an atmosphere conducive to life on an exoplanet. That one's kind of a in between. It found an exoplanet with methane and carbon dioxide, which is indicative theoretically of a water planet. And if there's a water planet, maybe that could be a so, you know, yes, no, maybe so. I don't know. Um, I said SpaceX's Starship will launch successfully into orbit. And I have good hopes for Starliner. They tried several times. <laughs> they really tried. Uh, didn't quite make it. Lots of explosions, but that's, you know, iteration in the space game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, it's pushed stuff off for human transport to the moon. But uh, yeah, did not get that one at all. Samples from asteroid Bennu will return to Earth and bring visitors from space along for the ride. We got the samples but no obvious little visitors from space. Not but yet. They haven't told us yet. Sure. Still, <laughs> yeah. so maybe. But it wasn't in 2023. So, um, What else did I say? Artificial intelligence will be the bane of teachers and librarians. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Scientists will use it successfully. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on a second. Hang on, hold, pause it. Why is it the bane of librarians? Oh, Where because artificial. <laughs> because artificial. Like I get the teachers because you're submitting reports, but if you're going in, it's like, and like, how is AI messing with librarians? Is it? Is it? You don't. Put, you don't have to ask librarians. Requesting books that it knows uh, fall in between Dewey decimal systems. Like I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, real, real yeah, citations yeah. don't exist anymore. Yeah. That's why. What? Citations. <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh, so the reference librarians are doing a lot of work like, <laughs> no, that it's not exist. in anything. That's <laughs> exactly. not anywhere. Nobody ever said that. I looked. Or they're sitting the around books. very lonely because everyone's making their own references from scratch. Exactly. <laughs> like, libra like reference librarians do fact checking. I don't need that. I have AI. It's all good. Uh, but I said scientists will use it to successfully identify many new drug targets, design proteins, enhance efficiency, and much more. That's my playing it very safely. But I'd happened. say, yeah. yeah. But that all, even the much more, it all happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one, I wasn't, this one was like one of my long throws. AI will enable us to speak with another of Earth's animal species. Does the uh, whale conversation count? I think so. Does it, like, did that did that happen? Yeah. It's know. tough. I, I I say you get partial credit for that one. Okay. <laughs> right. I like partial credit. It always helps. So it's, we don't uh, know what the whale said. Just because we got them to talk back to us. That doesn't mean we actually talked to them. <laughs> yes. Not true communication of with context and meaning. And yes. Yeah. Uh, I said, with the implosion of Twitter as a reputable platform, scientists and science communicators will continue to spread to new refugia for discussing science. Yeah. But connecting with the public will become more difficult, influencing the continued growth of distrust in science in the public sphere. And I have to say, I think that's kind of still happening. Mm -hmm. Yay. Um, but... <sighs> Now, Twist listeners will continue to find Twist a consistent source of optimism and curiosity. What say you, chat room? <laughs> Were we consistent? D did we do it <laughs> throughout the yeah, year? Yeah, the consistency part is tough, I think. But... <laughs> We're pretty 
good at the optimism and the curiosity. At least yes. I, I really, I really hope Kiki, so. you bring all the optimism. I <laughs> try to be the reality check that uh, every, every, everything should, everyone should smoke them where they got them. <laughs> oh boy. Kind of. All the fun. All the fun. Yes. All right. Well, those were mine. I did okay. Did fairly well. Fada says, as far as I'm concerned, we did it. We really, really did it. Yeah, that was a really good uh, success rate there. It's because, like I said, I play it close to the chest. Justin, mm -hmm. what? So I, I tend to be uh, a little bit more confident and arrogant, perhaps, in my confidence. Uh, and so really? I get, uh, sometimes get a little bit more specific with my predictions. Uh, in 2023, I said uh, the planet will continue to warm, the seas continue to rise, and much like COVID, people will continue to ignore that it is happening. I think, I think that, I think that part's a hit. But see, then I go too far. I said, that except for a handful of island nations that you can only find on maps made before 2024. So there are like five or six island nations that are petitioning to become recognized as nations even when their land is gone virtual nations mm. even yeah 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 and so that's it's going to be a new yep. classification of a nation without a uh, territory people without a place yeah people without a land uh, but mm -hmm. maintaining a an identity good enough to be a member of the un i suppose yeah so we're not quite but they're still on the map and if you make a map in 2024 those islands technically are Oh, here's a hit. Despite all evidence to the contrary, it will be discovered that smoking is actually good for you. You made up that study. <clears throat> <laughs> no, no. That the study's CDC. a mess. I gotta say, I read it. I know, I it was a mess. It, I, it's a mess. <laughs> the CDC, the CDC put out that report. And they didn't highlight the fact that their data showed that smoking amongst the severely depressed led to lower mortality rates. No, they did not. They, that's, they, that's the big piece there, amongst the severely depressed. Yeah. That doesn't mean Well, that's what we're talking about. But that's what we're talking about. Um, and, so, and so, yes, they highlighted exercise, even though exercise was... A slightly uh, higher mortality rate amongst the severely depressed than uh, smoking, but also also gloss over the fact that income inequality has a big uh, role to play as well. Anyway, yeah. In the prediction, I did go on to say that it uh, the discovery created a major boon for the one company that still made ashtrays until it was later discovered that the ashtrays cause cancer and it was them all along so i mean uh yeah i'll, I'll plus, give myself one for partial. credit <laughs> i'll give myself partial, like, partial uh, credit. You know, yeah you know the prognosticating you just got to get close to target you don't have to be 100 percent. james <laughs> webb space telescope as some people still call it will discover life on another planet the infographic of chemical spectrography indicating biological processes will be underwhelming at first. But but a later artist rendition of a winged toad as a possible <laughs> life form on that planet will capture the world's imagination. I feel like they this did, is happening over and over again. They didn't release that data, I think. I don't remember that being like a publication. Released yeah, they've, 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 yeah. They, they left out the winged toad so far. Yeah, that one still hasn't sure. happened. But they keep finding <laughs> they keep finding those what you would Chemical. expect for a life that is containing organic materials and some sort of life, uh, but uh, haven't gone so far as to discover a planet of winged toads. No, nope. winged winged. Uh, more space telescopes will be launched this year. That was last year. Discovering hundreds of interesting targets for the James Webb to get better images of. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's still other people like, oh, well, we got our telescope we worked on. We're going to put that up there. It's going to look at stuff. So there are. There's a bunch more uh, space telescopes than there were at the beginning of 2023. 
but nobody's talking about them because there's a much better one out there getting better resolution the pictures. of everything. Yeah. 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 2023 will be the year that fundamental mechanics behind gravity is finally figured out. Untangling space from time, challenging the expansion rate of the universe, and upending large portions of the standard model, but only in a quantum computer simulation. Ah, feel, that probably happened all the time. I feel like that happened. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the quantum computer simulations are discovering all sorts of things that only apply to within a quantum huh. computer simulation. I said artificial intelligence will be discovered to already be far superior to most people when it comes to making good dinner table conversation. That is a miss. Oh my gosh. The yes. language AI is still got the worst. Uh, still worst not quite sentence. there. <laughs> terrible sentence structures, terrible conversationalists, very repetitive, very redundant. No good. And what was I saying? Oh, a new age-reversing tissue regeneration therapy will be developed that all but eliminates death from natural causes. The researchers admittedly see the ramifications of social, economic, environmental consequences such a therapy would have on the world and decide to keep it a secret. However, a few self-help nutritionalists find out the secret and are willing to let you know all about it during late-night infomercials Conveniently, they have created a powdered milkshake version that produces the same results. That one's kind of a cheap prediction because I feel like that happens. You can't really year. prove or disprove that one. That's like well, that one happens every year. There's always a, a new secret. Science doesn't secret. want you to know. Science yes. wants you to be sick, but we have a milkshake that will that will make you healthy despite the the evil scientists knowing. That this is going to cure you of everything and take lipstick stains out of collars and do your taxes <laughs> for you. But but we won't, they won't tell you because they're part of a cabal. So drink this milkshake that we will send you once you subscribe for uh, $29.99 a month. You will get a bucket of whatever we put in there. That's fine. And we'll throw in a charged crystal while we're at it. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't swallow it, <laughs> please. <laughs> oh man! I will oh, say, hey. I will say, this hey. last year was uh, this is a miss, well, or it's a it's a soft hit because it can happen every year. But there were a lot of studies about food nutrition, food is medicine, uh, food uh, healthy food diet that uh, that failed to produce positive results. Several yeah. throughout the year, so. Uh, it may be that uh, healthy food isn't so much good for you as the bad stuff. You know, alternatives are bad for you. Like this, like a, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not that you, food might just be food, and that's just it. You can exercise, you can do whatever. It's the the food that's not really food that's messing everybody up. Mm hmm. It's all that processed stuff. Yeah. Off the science range, you had three others. What you got in there? Do I? Oh, I can't even see them here. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, I clicked on the box. Now I see it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I said uh, 49ers will face the Chiefs in the Super Bowl and win. Oh, no, that's a this year prediction. I got No, I got are you doing there. that? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Putin will be ousted from power. Didn't by happen. summer. Oh, that mm -hmm. still hasn't happened. But maybe that's mm -hmm. a this year prediction. Sometimes I get my years. I don't think so. I don't think up. so. <laughs> then Elon Musk will announce a new reality show where participants are given a small business to run into the ground. Whoever manages to wreck their business the most in the most epic way will become Twitter's CEO for a year. Uh, that one's obviously wrong because there is no Twitter anymore. He, 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 got <laughs> change. he, got he, he did first. try to make his own reality show where he fought mark zuckerberg though that did almost happen it did, <laughs> i'm so glad it did not that was but which one chickened out again oh they both oh yeah they made. both realized uh, i thought it was hey, I'm a billionaire oh, no. i, I yeah. shouldn't 
ever fight uh, anyone. Why would I? I'm a billionaire. How ridiculous. So silly. Dun, 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 dun. But Justin, you went out on a limb for some of those, even though there were partial credit. Some of them, I think, actually should stand for next year because, you know, whenever you're predicting, it's hard to keep it to one year. Very often, they come in two-year sort of chunks. Oh, really? Time is just... Wibbly-wobbly and tiny-wimey. Anyway, man. Yeah. Janice would say. All right, Blair, what did you predict Mm. last year and how'd you do? My predictions are always terrible. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So my first, most of them are jokes. My first one was um, a new social media platform will gain traction where you can change up the wallpaper, play music on your profile, and you can pick your top friends, maybe eight of them. No, MySpace did not make a resurgence last year, but uh, there are certainly other players in the game trying to take over the Twitter space. We'll see what happens. I think it's going to solidify in the next year. Uh, 3D printed meat will get some market trials and responses will be less than well done. No, nope. did whack-a, not hear that at all. <laughs> There's still, I don't know. I don't know what's holding him back. I think the taste, honestly, because from what I've heard, it always just tastes like nothing. Um, next, I predicted that tardigrades will do something weird. So I'm guessing that did happen, but we didn't report on it on the show as far as I could tell. Um, no, we did talk about tardigrade it. Tardigrades. We did yeah. talk about, I think it was uh, this year. The the tardigrades were discovered that they were once eaten by a snail could make it all the way through the snail's digestive system and out again. I thought that was the year again. before. Was it the year before? I that was 2022. I don't know. It could be. That's Kiki's looking. All right. While she looks, um, I also predicted that fully driverless self-driving cars will be active and prevalent in the Bay Area and cause problems. Yes, yes, yes. People have died. It's not good. <laughs> It's pretty scary. Um, So that was a big yes, unfortunately. Uh, First AI feature-length film will be released, and there will be too many fingers. No, but AI (laughs) certainly (laughs) get up to a lot of weird things. So Uh, so, uh, there's a partial. I'll give you a partial on that. There have been... yeah. Uh, images uh, that have come of of, of war for that, for whatever reason, were AI-generated. Uh, possibly because nobody wants to be in a war zone and take uh, photographs because they're killing oh, journalists. Sure, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. So images of destruction in Gaza have been shown representative of what's going on that were AI generated and did have too many fingers. <sighs> yeah, yeah. An occasional extra leg, probably. I, I, yeah, well, yeah. Anyway. Um, Thanks, AI. You're scary. Yeah. Uh, I predicted that we will cure cancer again and again. Um, And as far as I could tell, uh, the closest we got on our show in the reporting is that there was a story about forcing cooperation in cancer cells to basically um, initiate cell death. So pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, there there are. There's no treatments out there yet, but, but still. Yeah, there well there are there are several avenues of always as always, but the avenues that are taking place now are so much more targeted that I you know there we did so we did cure cancer. And we did come up right. with cures for specific cancers and treatments for specific types of tumors and but they still have to be tested and vetted, and no, and, well, yeah. no. Some of them, some of them have made it through some testing too. I mean, this is the thing. It's the the problem is cancer isn't one causal, right? The you know the mm-hmm. which is why I said dis- again and again. Well, and again, <laughs> yeah, because because <laughs> it has to be you, done you know, every time separate. Yeah, well, it's it's largely also because there's like a a group of genes that are producing proteins that need to work together to repair damage to cells. And any one of them that can't do their job or can't send the right signal can allow uh, cancer formation to take place. It's bad repair jobs that uh, create these monsters, sort of like Frankenstein uh, cells that that become cancerous and then do everything that they're supposed to do to survive uh, in a world where monsters are not wanted. But as we discover each of these sort of increments of change and ways that we can fix them, 
we get closer, but it's a long list of things that need to get fixed uh, before cancer can be eradicated completely. We're making progress. Yeah, of course. Yes. But it still looks good on paper when we say we've cured cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly that, a lot well, farther than we thought we'd be just a few years ago. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And some cancers. It's always five or 10 years ago. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's a there is a treatment that will reverse leukemia. My goodness. Which how can you yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can't fight that. Yeah, that 5 or 10 years is getting closer and closer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um okay, so I also predicted that California will experience a drought despite the storm parade we were experiencing at this time last year. I say as it currently rains outside my window. Now, <laughs> technically, right now today California is not in quote unquote drought conditions. But <laughs> reservoirs aren't exactly where they should be. There's still lots of um, trouble in the summer months getting the right water to the right places. So, mm -hmm. this is if you want to talk super technically, I don't think this is totally accurate, but water woes are not over and they will never be over in California. So, um, so <clears throat> and and my yeah. beef with that one is always that when I was a young man in California, <laughs> the the southern central valley was called the big nothing because there was nothing out there but desert dirt and cattle. That was it. And now, now it's endless orchards of almond trees. So I don't buy for a second that the drought is a drought in which people need to stop watering their lawns or take shorter lawns showers. Lawns are terrible. Don't you dare. And also, yeah, what? No, no, I we're don't want to hear fight it. you okay. on that one. Hey, on. what? <laughs> hey, wait, wait. What, do you guys, um, what part are you fighting about? Hey, wait. What part are you fighting against? Lawns are bad, okay? Yeah, I'm not lawns, lawns are terrible. Either. But but consumers also golf use courses. Less you than know how much water. water goes to golf courses in the state of California. But That's this commercial. is not the conversation we're That's currently commercial. having. You're talking about my prediction. So let's less keep than ten percent of the water. And there's moving no along. Moving along. Yeah. Even moving along. Um, I also predicted that we will learn something new about snot, which was a weird random thing that I Mucin? guessed at. And I, as far as I can tell, it's no. No, I didn't see any snot news from last year. But please, anybody who's listening, if they found some snot news from 2023, send it my way. Um, frogs will once again dominate the animal corner. Absolutely. There was a lot of frog talk last year. Um, and I also predicted that Twist would do a live show. That didn't happen mm. because, you know, I got indisposed. <laughs> and lots of other things happened. Lots of other things. You know, Justin's on the other side of the planet. There's all sorts of stuff going on. But um, we'll get we back to live shows eventually. We can always yeah. hope, right? Yeah. And we know it would be great. That would be a real moment for sure. Oh, and to go back to your tardigrades, tardigrades didn't necessarily oh. do anything weird, but there was a study okay. from July 2023 suggesting tardigrades evolved from worms and had claws. And those claws are potentially going to be used in uh, creating swimming micro robots to allow them to grab onto things. And then um, some researchers mm -hmm. have decided to try and put human DNA, I mean, uh, tardigrade DNA into human DNA, like for proteins and stuff that could be helpful. Oh, man. For health. This because tardigrades are survivors. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we'll see. This sounds like the really old way of doing science. We'll take something from this and put it in that and see what happens. Yeah. We're Sorry. gonna do it. Yeah. We are gonna do it. Oops. Hey, everybody. If you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science. We have just completed our review of our predictions from 2023. And now it is time for us to talk about our predictions from for, not from, but for the year ahead. If you are loving the show, make sure that you share it with people. We'd love to get as many followers and subscribers as possible, and we can do that with your help. So make sure to share the link, get a friend of ours, of yours to become a friend of ours. We appreciate the fact that you're here. All right, time for the predictions for the year ahead. Who is first? Justin? Ah. ah. All right. In the year 2024, 
It will be discovered that Neanderthals are the result of a hybridization event between early humans and Denisovans, the late surviving members of Homo erectus that had been existing throughout Asia. Turns out we discovered the mule before the horse and thought the horse was half mule, making us all look like a bunch of jackasses. In yes. the year 2024, because <laughs> see, that's a donkey. That's how that <laughs> I got, I got it. comes I got together it. at the end there. In the year 2024, every major neurodegenerative disease will have an effective cure working its way through clinical trials. While large-scale access to these innovative treatments will still be many years away, rapid improvements in quality of life increases will be seen in the test subjects, prompting an accelerated effort by regulators and lawmakers to fast-track the rollout of the new treatments as they are badly needed by aging regulators and lawmakers. In the year 2024, <laughs> self-driving cars will be replaced by cars you drive yourself. The experiment officially over. Giving a driver's license to a toddler AI was a bad idea. The experiment will be repeated so again in about 15 years when the AI is a little more mature. Until then, watch the road for AI bicycles, where we should have started to begin with. <sighs> oh, dear. <laughs> AI will be used to communicate with aggressive orca off the coast of Spain. The killer whales will indicate some surprise as they had no idea we were intelligent. The conversation lasts only a few minutes, though the phrase finless, finless fish thieving pests comes up several times, seemingly a reference to us. I feel like this is a short story in the works. <laughs> <laughs> In the year 2024, researchers will discover that B cells and not T cells are crucial to curing the common cold and other respiratory viruses. Instead of vaccines designed to train T cells to recognize pathogens, B cell optimization will be performed using a prime editing technique that changes all of the body's B cells into the genetic twin of that one coworker who never seems to get sick. Everyone who gets the shot becomes allergic to red bell peppers. However, everyone who does not get the shot suffers from a higher likelihood of thinking that Jason Aldean has talent. In the year 2024, <laughs> ultra-processed foods will be forced to carry health warnings for all the already known diseases that they cause or contribute to. Meanwhile... The unsubstantiated claims of healthy food will be removed from its packaging. People around the world will recognize the person in 2024 that they most want to be in a mirror. In the year 2024, <laughs> world peace will be achieved, according to an international governmental panel. This will come to as a surprise to everyone still living in a war zone. Similar international governmental panel will also declare that global warming has been stopped, that the COVID-19 pandemic is over, and that the global economy has never been better. In the year 2024, a cage full of research mice undergoing an intelligence augmentation experiment will escape and are never found. Their descendants will eventually inherit the Earth. In the year 2024... The size of the universe will be discovered to be much smaller than we once thought, by over a few dozen magnitudes. It won't make interstellar space travel any easier, as the same discovery finds that we, too, are more than a few dozen magnitudes smaller than we thought we were. The correction of scale suggests that the entire known universe could fit into an average size coffee mug of the old model. Oh, dear. <laughs> In the year 2024, scientists will discover new animal species, a new aspect of human biology, several methods for curing previously incurable diseases, an unexpected cosmological feature in space, a greener way to generate and store energy, and will use AI to produce unprecedented discoveries wherever 
big data sets are available. And in the year 2024, I'm like, I don't want to, I want you to stop right there on that big optimistic prediction. That was great. Okay, what okay, what's this one? It's and the year 2024, better. hottest year on record. Darn it. I knew you were gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> Safe bet. Oh, those were some fantastic predictions. Self-tying shoelaces. The shoelaces that tie themselves. Or maybe they're cars. Who knows? Blair, I, what do you predict? Like, yes. <laughs> Seriously, like the AI, I, my favorite one in there, all of those is is really gotta be the AI bicycles. Like, how did why, they not didn't start, we do start that? there? How did they just give AI a driver's license without even seeing if it could like manage a bike lane? Yeah, it's also uh, the vehicles that are self-driving are like five times as heavy as original gas cars. So it's not even a 2,000 pound menace. It's like a 10,000 pound menace. Inertia. It's a thing. Oh, man. <sighs> All right. Um, yes, Kiki, you want my predictions? Let's go. Let's go. My you predict? terrible <laughs> prediction in 2024. I predict that um, cats will be declared an invasive species in one U.S. state. No. California. Make it California. Please let it be probably. California. It's, it's going to be Hawaii, probably. Anyway, oh, um, yeah. Teslas will be available via vending machine, but sales will be disappointing. <laughs> uh, that was actually from Brian. <laughs> I like that. That's Brian's like prediction that for me. Thanks, Brian. Um, an AI written song will chart on the Billboard Top uh, 100 and will raise questions. Yeah. All those questions we were talking about yesterday, actually. Um, with streaming services getting ads back and becoming more expensive, DVD players and CD players will start flying off the shelves. <laughs> what? Physical media that you just own? Physical media. Who knew? A synthetic brain in a dish will play an AI in chess. And betting on the match, all in Bitcoin, of course, will be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> A new frog species will be discovered that is so beautiful under UV that I won't be able to focus on anything else in that show. <laughs> I believe this. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be there. So how it sounds. Oh, it's so cute. Oh my gosh. Oh, look at it. It's so pretty. Yeah. Everybody, I'm sorry. I was still this. thinking about the frogs. <laughs> uh, as we learn more about how the brain responds to music, prescription jams, jam sesh required mm -hmm. by a doctor will be the new norm fascinating mm -hmm. that's an idea prescription Oop. music Oop. and last i predict that in 2024 my predictions will be terribly inaccurate watch you be the most accurate of all of us <laughs> except for that one <laughs> <laughs> it's just hedging my bets you know uh -huh. i finally want to get one right <laughs> <laughs> you've gotten them right come on <laughs> Uh, so let's see. Similarly to Justin, in 2024, I predict that climate will continue to warm globally. And I'm, of course, making this prediction because El Nino and it, 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 that whole thing, it affects stuff. But yeah, it's going to keep warming. Um, elections around the globe are likely to prove contentious and stall political progress on climate and AI regulation. So 2024, I think we're going to see like not a lot of progress on regulation of this stuff because politicians are going to be like, hey, look at me, look at me, vote for me, vote for me, instead of actually doing stuff. Um, and in those lines, uh, Nate Silver will make a lot of uninformed public comments about various scientific topics and a lot of bad ele election predictions. Um, yeah, in that. Like if you really do, if anybody has political aspirations, just come out against climate change regulation. What? You will get so much funding so quickly. It will just be instantaneously in the, the campaign with the most money I in know. your local area. No, fun. no taxes. No, no regulations about taxes on your anymore. gas taxes fields. Are so low, they don't even know they're paying tax. They don't live in Oregon, do they? Uh, AI deep fakes online during these elections are going to confuse and impact voters and the elections absolutely so you're think, so right and that's terrifying yeah um, are you talking about the just regular ads no 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 not regular ads but the 
deep fakes created by AI, people using AI to deep fake mm-hmm. stuff in and put it on social media to get it out there. And the candidate it's going... saying or doing or being yeah. photographed doing something yeah. that's going to influence things, even though it's it going to influence stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. I mean, the fact checkers are going to have a real, real time of it this next year. Um, Someone is going to land a robot on the moon. Someone. (sighs) A lot of people who want foot rope. Someone is going to do it this year. (sighs) Okay. Um, NASA is going to launch the Europa Clipper mission, and that launch is going to be successful. There's not going to be a bad rocket. There's not going to be explosions. It's going to launch. It's going to head out there. We're not going to really learn anything from it until about 2030, but it's going to, the launch is going to be successful. That's what I say. Um, There is an experiment that hopefully they're going to, like, I really think they're going to put their data together. A couple of experiments that have been going on looking at the mass of the neutrino. So I think we are going to get a really accurate measurement of the mass of the neutrino this next year published. People are going to report on it. 2024 is going to be the year of the exascale supercomputer. US, UK, EU, China. People are going to have exascale supercomputers either working or being built all over. Wait, what is, what is the that exascale? What does that mean? Ex, it's like 10 to the 18 process. It's a, It's the parallel processing, massive super parallel processing. Um, that will uh, allow for things like digital twin research and um, I don't know, there's the physics research. Look, they want to put one in the National Ignition Facility to uh, look at uh, ignition of nuclear warheads for our nuclear stockpile. They also are going to be putting one at uh, um, uh, Argonne National Labs that's going to be doing uh, more digital t- digital twin type research and quantum processing but well let's see i think we're going to see a lot of positive progress on mrna vaccines next year i think we're going to see some results from some of the trials that are going on i mean hope maybe we'll see more mrna vaccines making it further in the process neither blair nor justin will have another baby in 2024 um, me for sure. I'm, this is I'm my prediction. I'm looking at Justin's face right now. Like, mm. I have, I have. Technically, there is time. So there is time. This is. I'm not throwing down the gauntlet. This isn't a challenge. I'm just. This is no. my prediction. No. <laughs> no, I think it is a challenge. That's fine. Oh, I'll dear. figure it out. Oh, dear. <laughs> my uh, house. No problem. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and science and twists are going to continue to bring the optimistic slant for humanity to our audience throughout 2024. I'm not saying it's going to be all the same, but we're going to continue to do it. All right. Hey, everybody, this is This Sipkin Science, and if you are listening right now, it would be super awesome if you are enjoying the show, you want to support us, head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link, and become a patron of the show. If you don't want to help us out on a monthly basis, you can also click on the Zazzle link, and we have all sorts of really cool products, merchandise that are Twist-related that have been artistically created for the most part by Blair taken from her uh, annual calendars. Oh, Hey, and there's a 2024 calendar there uh, that Blair made this year for all of you to enjoy. So multiple ways to help keep twist going, bringing you that optimistic slant throughout 2024. We're here for you. We thank you for your support. And we're coming on back right now for the first Blair's animal corner of 2024. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? <gasps> oh my gosh, so lovely to hear that song. It's been so long. In 2024. Yes. Uh, well, first I have fruit bats. So uh, fruit bats 
are named fruit bats because they eat that's right fruit. beef everybody no yeah no <laughs> fruit hopefully fruit. everyone listening shouted along fruit great good job everybody um so fruit bats eat fruit which for us might have been a problem because we would eat nothing but a sugary food and therefore we would get everybody say it diabetes, diabetes. that's right yes Little excellent issues. um yeah. okay <laughs> So uh, diabetes, the eighth leading cause of death in the United States for humans, is a pretty big deal. So uh, UC San Francisco scientists decided to look at fruit bats to see how they can survive this extremely sugary diet. How do they not get and die from diabetes? Um, so with diabetes in the human body, that means you can't produce or detect insulin. You have problems controlling blood sugar. But these fruit bats, for some reason, they can control their blood sugar no matter what, no matter how much sugar they consume. And so uh, they want to make better insulin or sugar sensing therapies for people by looking at the bats. They focused on the evolution of the bat pancreas, which controls blood sugar, and the kidneys. Uh, the kidneys because uh, the kidneys get impacted by diabetes and they have problems um, pulling out uh, nutrients and uh, and salts out of uh, out of waste, right? So that's like the whole thing. Um, right. And so uh, that's like how people end up on dialysis and all these things. So they found out that fruit bat pancreases compared to the pancreas of an insect eating bat um, had extra insulin producing cells and they had genetic changes that helped them process this huge amount of sugar. Also the kidneys had adapted um, to be able to pull electrolytes uh, to retrain them, retain them uh, better from the, the very watery fruits that they're eating all the time. And so in some cases, a single letter change of DNA made this diet viable for the fruit bats, a single letter change. So that's something that um, might not be so difficult to transfer to humans uh, as we thought maybe originally. Um, so right. it's they, super specific. It would be super specific genetic yeah. mo modification, but if they're similar genes, that's fascinating. Yes, exactly. So they analyze gene expression um, and the regulatory DNA uh, by looking at individual cells. And so they were able to figure out what types of cells in which organs were related to this, but also how those cells regulate the gene expression, how they manage the diet and all these different things. So, um, yeah, the long story short is um, that this study could be one of many that then leads to transferring the specific kidney and pancreas function in these bats to something that we can use as a therapy in humans. Pretty cool to kind of look at. Are they close enough? I mean, I guess that's that's a big question. I mean, it still is, you know, how close is their kidney and pancreas functionality to human and what are the genes and the proteins and enzymes that are involved in the processing of blood? And um, yeah, like, I guess that's yeah. the big question is like what you're what they're finding right. from the bats. How easy would it be to transfer that stuff? It's fascinating. Right. And I, and I think the, the key is that they were able to see a very clear difference between the insect eating bat and the sugar eating bat. Mm -hmm. And so um, because they found the exact difference between these two with the very different diet, uh, they think that there uh, there's potential therapies kind of on the horizon because um, they were able to narrow it down so specifically between these two bats. That's amazing. So but I really, yeah, but I, I mean, the bats, it works. That's what I'm saying is like, it works with the bats, yeah, but like, yeah. is this how it would work? Could we make it work the same way in people? Great question. Very, very far away from figuring that out, but. Right. <laughs> but a lot closer Still to pretty figuring cool. it out in mice, which is. The right. Bat, right. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So if you can get from the bats to the mice, then you can get from the mice to the humans for sure. And and with the um, you know, with our advances in mRNA and everything, it's like you don't necessarily have to do uh, a genetically modified mouse, but you can, of course. Uh, you could actually perhaps even just do uh, additions of, of mRNA protein based on that mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. see if that can, uh, an elevated level of that, sort of like a diabetes vaccine, if you will. 
Oh, that'd be uh, amazing. Something like that. that was the other thing I meant to yeah. mention was that uh, the the DNA related to this ability to eat exclusively fruit, uh, they thought was junk DNA before this study. Yeah, yeah. Just a bunch of junk DNA in the back. It's, yeah, extra, it's extra, extra. Don't worry about, about it. About it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very important. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, uh, and then my my second story for tonight uh, is, is a kind of a Blair's Animal Corner classic of a misunderstood animal that has gotten a bad rap for a very long time for no reason. That's the California grizzly bear. So uh, those of us who are not from California who are listening, you may or may not know that the California state flag has a brown bear on it. And we do not have any brown bears native to California anymore. So it's it's kind of a funny thing that our, our flag is a brown bear, but that's because we killed them all. So why? Why did they oh, all no. get um, get hunted out of California? And the story goes, it's because European settlers came in, and among the other lovely things they did for the environment, as they spread across the United States, as she says with sarcasm, um, they wanted to get rid of the predators in the area because they thought that it was dangerous. They thought that uh, they were eating livestock and crops. And uh, they thought that um, it, essentially it was a rite of passage to say, all right, I, I killed, I killed a bear. Think about the song, Davy Crockett killed him a bar when he was only three, right? There the you top go. predator. Yeah. Yes. So grizzly bears, the story goes, they were these big menacing things. Humans could not live with them. So it was the humans or the bears. The bears got hunted out of California. And thank goodness, because California is very populous, right? Uh, well, <laughs> turns out, uh, by looking at pelts and bones in private and public collections of grizzly bears throughout the state of California, they were not as big, nor as dangerous, uh, nor as much of a threat to livestock as uh, one would be led to believe. Uh, the reputation that they had was that they weighed uh, as much as a thousand kilograms, which for somebody who worked with bears, I'm going to tell you right now, no, no, grizzly bears don't get that big. But sure, fine, you can say that if you want in your like legend conversation <laughs> that you've got. Um, and also that they they ate exclusively or mostly livestock and other animals. Uh, but by looking at the bones and pelts, uh, they use nitrogen and carbon isotopes to learn about the diet. So let's tackle that first. Uh, any guess what they found? They fish. What were they eating? Fish, fish. salmon, berries. berries. I guess. Uh, <laughs> 9% meat. So berries, pretty much. Berries. Wow. <laughs> yeah, grizzly bears are are not really hunters. They're definitely... Uh, grazers and scavengers they just kind of they're opportunists they eat whatever they can find so only nine percent meat mostly plants um, interesting yeah uh in fact so this... even when uh they were when humans were or Europeans specifically were all over the california territories even then after that in the largest amounts only 25 percent of diets was meat yeah, this is and this is likely because the the whole reason that there were bears is because they say uh, the grizzly bear, brown bear, is because they survived the younger Dryas. The the short faced bear, which was a bigger bear, was a big game hunter and died out during the younger Dryas, as did all of the big game hunters in 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 the in the that the western United States. They all vanished. Too bad because, humans weren't there. Oops. Because what? the the because <laughs> the big game disappeared, and so they yeah. all the what survived uh, ate berries and fish. Yeah, exactly. Um, and as far as how big they were, they measured the size of the bones and the pelts, and determined the average weight of bears was two hundred kilograms, yeah. <laughs> a fifth the size, which actually is much closer to the size of grizzly bear that I have worked with and seen in the past getting to be around topping out at 500 pounds. That sounds more accurate. Um, right. And so the idea, it's just very silly. Um, but so essentially the grizzly bears, they were not killed because they were eating livestock or because they were these giant menaces. They were killed 
as trophies. Um, that's pretty much it. And because Yay. if they wandered into human territories, people felt threatened and they decided to dispatch them. So, and, Which is what happened across Europe before mm -hmm. the civilized Europeans came to conquer the Americas. You know, that again was in quotes and with sarcasm. Um, but mm -hmm. the, big, the big predators were all eliminated from the forests in Europe uh, across the UK, a lot of Europe there, they got, that's what happened. They, they got rid of the, the big predators. It was humans first and that's the way it's, mm -hmm. it's always been. So they, they came in, they tried to do that here. Oh, our history. Yeah. I mean, think about it. It's, livestock is one thing, but if you talk about threats to humans, there were humans that lived in California before the Europeans. What? When there were bears here. And they did just and fine. It was fine. It was part of the deal. Just, just you know. But anyway, um, I do think it's very interesting that this is the story that we tell about why our state flag has a now extinct animal on it in the state of California. And uh, it's it's all kind of a lie. <sighs> the state flag is now not a lie, but it is a, uh, a remembrance of the great animals that were here before. <laughs> yeah. it's, for, it's for memories. It's fascinating. I love the way that you brought it up too. Like the, um, just the, the, the stories, the mythical stories, the historical st st tall tales that were told. Yeah. I mean, you wonder, I mean, Oh, bones, maybe there were some big grizzlies, but you know, those are going to be the outliers not a, right not and so that's the other thing they said seven, eight feet tall did their outlay right yeah is that almost exclusively the ones that were mounted or turned into rugs or turned into some sort of trophy were the biggest ones because people right. were bragging so that skewed the expectation of how big the average bear was because those are the only ones being displayed so it's, yeah yeah, that, and of course, they're made to look all ferocious by the taxidermist when yeah. they were probably shot sleeping. You know, grazing oh. berries. Yeah, like they they got they got drunk on apples that that had fermented, and then took a nap in a courtyard. Hmm. Yeah, who were the real opportunists? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I mean, we all know. We all know. Blair, thanks you. Thank you for a great animal corner. Of course. Yeah. I'm going to take us to space right now and talk just for a moment about the Dark Energy Survey. This is the Dark Energy Camera at Noir Labs CTIO. And the CTIO is the Saratolo Inter American Observatory. And it's been surveying distantly deeply into the uh, universe to look for supernova. So originally, many, many decades ago, there was a survey of supernovas that came to determine what we call the standard cosmological constant or what is known in the physics world as lambda cold dark matter. And the model that came from the survey was based on something like 52 type 1a uh, supernova events. And so these researchers were like, okay, the supernova events, super, it's a very small sample size. So let's look for more supernova, let's look further back in time, let's look bigger, and let's try and see if this cosmological constant of universal expansion that we've determined based on the timing of these supernova, the brightness of the, the light from these standardized supernova explosions, you know, let's see if it really is standard. Let's see if it really holds up when we get a really, really good sample. So, yeah, and and real quick, too, just to, the when you're saying standardized supernova, that's because the whatever candle strength a one A is thought to be is thought to always be the same. They're categorized as the right. same. Once it's a one A supernova, it's like it's the most bright setting possible on yes. on our scale. So we assume. First of all, all of these are the same. 
which we is assume, sort of interesting. Right? Yeah. It's a big assumption, right? Yeah. It's a very big assumption. And so uh, these researchers with this dark energy survey that was um, based on this uh, four meter telescope that was at the CTIO, the Cerro Tolo, Tololo Inter-American Observatory, um, they analyzed over 1,500 dis distant supernovae. And by analyzing them and putting them through um, machine learning techniques, they were actually able to aid in the classification to create a higher quality and more consistent quality of classification of the supernovae that they were looking at. And they made a very uniform, high highly consistent data set of uh, supernovae that were about 1,499 likely 1A supernova. And these are beyond a redshift of 0.2. And so this is quintupling the number that we had uh, beyond a redshift of 0.5. So this is a huge scale up from where we were previously with only like 52 supernova to infer the thing that causes expansion of the universe, which what we is what we have inferred and decided is this energy called dark energy. Dark energy is got to be constant. It's got to be this thing. Supernovas, they, they told us that the universe is expanding. And, oh, there's acceleration happening. Okay, it's got to be constant. This is all good. We've got the super... Look. Other data has suggested this is not exactly true. So the most exciting thing for me uh, about this uh, this study and what they have shared um, and what will be published in the uh, Ast American Astronomical Astrophysical Journal, and they just uh, just presented these results at the American Astronomical Society this Monday. Um, their findings are consistent, but not definitive in terms of what we understand or what we thought we understood about dark energy. So um, on the screen right now, I have an image of supernova that have been sampled within the field covered by the detectors of this dark energy camera. Um, and so the, the, the light from this particular image corresponds to time travel about 0.6 billion years. There's a quasar also that has a red shift that is equivalent to light travel time of 11.5 billion years in the image. So they're able to really take a lot of objects in the images and determine where and how far in the past they existed. Um, and in doing this, they were able to create a sample set that does fit within the lambda cold matter model, dark matter model, um, or dark energy model, but not exactly. It's not that there's not a non-accelerating universe. It fits a model of an accelerating, expanding universe, but there's a lot of variability. And so it doesn't fit perfectly. And because of the variability, it suggests that there is actually the possibility that dark energy is not consistent across space and time, that it has changed over space and time, and that there may be um, acceleration or differences at different points in cosmic time. So it's it does, it, it supports the idea of the expanding accelerating universe, but not necessarily the consistency of dark energy. So there is definitely more to be looked at moving forward, but I find it intriguing and exciting and the fact that we can just look at these objects based on uh the red shift or the blue shift of the light and start to get an idea of how far away things are um how fast light and space time are accelerating mm -hmm. and, and and just to be clear Scaling. they're not accelerating quickly mm -hmm. and in terms of the amount of expansion uh, that takes place as light travels for a year is a I'll almost say astronomically small number. Uh, the shift is so tiny you would never ever notice it even in, a, in a, the most sensitive instrumentation on Earth. Right. But over vast 
uh, parsecs of space and deep time. And when we're talking about something that can be 0.6 billion years of traveling, well, well, then those those things become a little bit more obvious. And then for objects that are further out, and then further out, the acceler- the cumulative acceleration effect of all these things expanding in every direction all at once makes it makes it seem like very rapid, uh, quick expansion. Oh, things are flying apart. Uh, but however, in terms of any sort of measurement of space uh, that we can relate to, it's almost nothing. I just think it's wonderful that we finally have a larger sample set. Uh, this is the beginning. Uh, it's not done for sure. They're going to be looking at looking for more of these uh, supernovae. Um, And I love the fact that they are using machine learning algorithms to allow the classification so that there's higher quality assurance of the timing and the brightness of the supernovae, the amount of energy that has allowed. So this in doing this experiment and what they have made happen, they've also pioneered new techniques that will lead to the next generation of, uh, of results and data, experiments, results, and data uh, with respect to dark energy and our view of the universe. Yeah. The, the other thing that's too is I was looking at that graphic, like the whole problem with the 1A being a candle brightness that's set in a, we think this is what they, like, like there's a maximum amount of burn that can take place in a, in a, in space where, with the supernova. Uh, maximum amount of energy, a threshold of some sort, which could be controlled by the physics of something that I don't understand. But it's also possible that that whole chart lines up much better than we think it does, just because we have to make some uh, assumptions about that candle strength, like we, human we assumptions don't... based on where well, we're from. And yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> basically how we have triangulated and figured out distances and categorize things because we can't actually take a light meter up to a supernova and see exactly how uh, much, how bright and how much energy it is uh, because that's also related to how far away it is. Uh, I think that that chart that showed like all those different things, uh, it might actually be lining up with the expansion much better than uh, we think it does, but it's almost like right. we're missing a partial parameter of brightness from but a we- supernova we haven't looked at yet or maybe not measured yet. Yeah. All right. It's, it's tricky because it's also tied into how, fa- how, uh, how far away we think it is. Right. And so if Which we assume it, could it, also be... it can't get any brighter than this, but it is brighter than that. That means it could be further away. So, so that's, that's why there's a little bit of, I think, uh, could be all over the place. It could be actually, the universe could be much more standardized. Than, uh, than and we, we could be like living in a weird uh, mirror universe, like a hall of mirrors where the light's been bounced at us so many times, you know, but it's just, yeah, it's still going fast. It's all there, whatever. Ah, this is what we see. Looks normal to me. No way to shoot an arrow in that kind of a hall of mirrors archery range. Oh, speaking of archery, transition smoothly achieved. Uh there's new evidence of uh, the rise of archery in uh, the Andes Mountains of South America. This is a study led by University of California at Davis. They focused on Lake Titicaca Basin in the Andes Mountains. Anthropologists found through an analysis of 1,179 projectile points that covered dates over 10,000 years into the past that the rise of archery technology dates to around 5,000 years ago. So this is previous research held that archery in the Andes emerged around 3,000 years ago. This new research indicates bow and arrow technology coincided with both expansion of exchange networks and a growing tendency for people to reside in villages. So people living together, pooling knowledge, sharing technology. Yeah. So that would be also uh, around the time that uh, the first current modern Europeans 
were arriving in Europe. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. 5,000 years ago, there was also a study recently that suggested that's when the genes for uh, or that are responsible for multiple sclerosis ended up in European populations. Yeah. Um, that a group of cow herders, aggressive, <laughs> murderous cow herders, <laughs> 5,000 years ago, brought their sheep and their cows and murdered people and dominated them and gave them their genes that protected them from sheep and cattle <laughs> diseases. But they now don't do anything. Oops. So 5,000 then... years ago in the Andes, that's um, they, that they're looking at these and that's what they're... Yeah, bow and arrow yeah. technology. Uh... But separate. So this would be like convergent social evolution this has nothing to do with um the europeans it has nothing to do i mean it, this would have been no no they're not gonna own, europeans right? aren't gonna show up uh yeah. for another oh 4500 years or so yeah 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 the, um, Interesting. yeah yeah and of course there's already pyramids in south america that are yeah. ten thousand years old and older than the pyramids of egypt but it's it's one of those one of those things is just it's worth always repeating and reminding people that it's been around the idea that the the new world was discovered or even called the new world even though it's much older of a world than the people who discovered it and called it the new world it's always bears repeating okay so now we're going to move to <laughs> southern china where researchers have discovered that the, an ancient ape survived until around somewhere between 215 and 295,000 years ago, it went extinct. But this isn't just your average ape. These were giants, three meter tall apes, weighing in at somewhere around 250 kilograms, which is somewhere around 550 pounds. They, like a grizzly bear. Giganto. I'm currently Googling blocking. how big an orangutan is because apes, the way that they, their stance is, um, mm -hmm. they're always bigger than you think when you like see them in a zoo and stuff like that. Cause but, they got it. Yeah. Um, Cause they do a lot of squatting. It's, a, I mean, what a quick Google tells me that orangutans um, can be up to about five feet um, and up mm -hmm. to about 200 pounds. Yeah. So double that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. Terrifying. Uh, what's really kind of interesting about this is that, you know, this is this is sort of uh, showing that they they went extinct um, much more recently. So we, they, previously they found tooth and bone and uh, they they knew that these gigantic gigantic. Well, they even named it. Uh, Gigantopithecus blackie, eye, blackie, <laughs> black eye. Uh, they knew they existed in southern China, and they knew this was a thing, but they didn't know when. They thought they must have been much, much older than this, uh, because there was no, they didn't have good dating, even though these, they found them in about 11 different cave systems, collected thousands of teeth. They finally have what they are, you know, some reliable dating, and and now uh, have pegged it between that two hundred fifteen to two hundred ninety five thousand years ago, uh, as when the last of these giant apes would have been in southern China. Now, that means very. This is this is human ancestry goes back further than this. Where is it in Africa? But the the Neanderthals right. would have been out of uh, Africa and probably in the the far western uh, Asian, you know, the Caucasus Mountains, somewhere around Iran into the into that area. They would have been up through the Levant, up into uh, Iran, up into the Caucasus Mountains, what is now present day Georgia, uh, country of. 
And in China, we had late surviving Homo erectus, who was still likely running around, you know, Denisovans, uh, hybrids of or the donator to the hybrid Neanderthal, whichever turns out to be the different. So this is another giant hominin. This is the biggest hominin on the planet that we uh, that we ever could have encountered. So when we talk about stories of, uh, you know, we have all these mythological stories. Oh, giants that walked the earth. Oh, well, actually, yeah, the, there were. Oh, what about the little people? Oh, yeah, Homo floriensis. Actually, there were. Like, like these, these, these tales of mythology. There's actually giant Bigfoot. I mean, this is Bigfoot. This is actually bigger than I think Bigfoot is normally represented. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even. Yeah. It was the thing that humans could have found, could have interacted with. We know that humans, current modern humans, likely did reach places like Europe and as far out as Siberia, perhaps much earlier than we think. Although, again, it could be a tangled web of what's a Neanderthal, if they're, uh, what's a human, what's, whose DNA are we really looking at when we look at some of these ancient DNA signals of early humans reaching places like the Altai Cave. But yeah, we, it's, very, it's very possible, and I would say likely, that some human ancestors encountered these giants. Well, they were all trying to live, probably get shelter in caves. They were probably, probably yeah. Can you imagine? Like, hey, I found a cave, and then you go in there, <laughs> yeah. and then there's a bunch of giant sleeping apes. So you spear Oopsies. one while it's sleeping, and then you take it and you taxiderm it to look all fierce. And everybody's right. like, oh, he killed look a you, big good one. hunter. There's only three. And then. <sighs> You know, the legend is born. Uh, the big feet. The big bears. Wasn't that one from this last year you reported on, maybe? Was that Where the Bigfoot big is like the stand, yeah. is standing up bears. Yeah, standing bears. That's what we talked about yesterday. Um, um, my last story for the night tonight has to do with wings. Not fairy wings, not bird wings, but insect wings. Where the heck do insect wings originate? Where'd they come from? Researchers have been trying to figure out when and where insects evolved their wings and from which bodily structure they evolved. Um, so it's a, you know, this is evolution. All the things on our bodies that we have right now, we're probably doing other things at some point in evolutionary history and some species that predated us, right? That is in our evolutionary path, right? So like the fact that your inner ear started as part of your jaw. Yes, exactly. We yeah. go through, uh, I, my favorite is the, um, um, what, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it now. I finally past the point of not remembering um are, anyway. are you talking about your hyoid no the the gills that we once yeah. once had you know we don't need oh. gills anymore it comes from our our fishy ancestry mm -hmm. um yeah the, but the hyoid there are all sorts of things that have been co-opted for different uses and yeah. what were they doing originally uh researchers at the biology center of the czech academy of sciences just published their work, uh, a group of entomologists uh, in the journal Communications Biology with their German co colleagues, they looked at fossils of larvae from the, uh, from the Paleozoic era. They looked at these larval insects. And in looking at these fossilized insects, they determined that insect wings very, very likely they because of these fossils, they kind of found fossils that probably predated modern aquatic and land insects. And so there's kind of like, okay, there's some overlap. They all probably came from the same place at one one point in time. And they determined that based on the factors that they saw, little gill buds and covers and other things that insects very likely uh, generally 
their wings came from gills. What? Yes. And this is something that has, uh, it, when you look at uh, like uh, lady uh, lace wings or ladyflies, like some insects that do have aquatic larvae, there are features that look, you know, they have little gill buds and gill plates that are on the abdomen and these little, and it's like, okay, you see that they could kind of come from that, but it's been this really interesting evolutionary mystery. And so, um, yeah, they say that there were notably, there are all these pairs of flattened projections on the sides of the abdomen that probably functioned as gills. And the structures are really similar to these pads that are seen in the larvae of uh, modern insects. And they do you know, give the the statement that although the fossils certainly do not re represent the ancestor of winged insects, their larva, and the adults of the group had fully functional wings, and it's an ancient group of insects. And so given the fact that the larva of other ancient insect taxa, such as mayflies and dragonflies are also aquatic, it supports the possibility that the aquatic environment played, it, played an important role in the very beginnings of the evolution of winged insects. From gills to flattened projections to wings. But then how do like baby dragonflies like survive in the water? Like, do they, they don't need wings stuff? when they're in the water. They go through no. a, uh, they go, they transform, right? You know, they metamorphose. Yeah, but do, do they have gills or how are they doing the underwater thing? They don't have gills per se, but they do have the uh, gill pads and they have um, gill. Yes. So yeah. do they have to get them back separate from where the wings grow or can we just look at them? <laughs> yeah, I don't get like, I think it's the whole like ontogeny re recapitulates phylogeny where you can kind of see that some before. features. I still don't understand it. Yeah. So ontogeny is the evolutionary or the, no, ontogeny is the development of an organism throughout it, how it develops through its life. Recapitulates, so repeats phylogeny. Phylogeny is the evolutionary path. Yeah. So that's why it, the statement it kind of goes like we see the little the gills, the little openings in the you know the um, in our our own embryos that go away and disappear throughout development. But that is a structure that was necessary at one point in our our own history. But usually. Yeah. Um, Stru similar structures beget similar structures and so this right. is like super weird because you would think that the gills would have ended up as some of the other mechanisms internally in, right. in insects that make up their weird respiration methods that aren't mm. like our closed circulatory system um, or mm. our closed respiratory system so right. you'd think it would kind of like be in the abdomen as part of their respiration or something like that right. but it's not it's it's wings that's wild yeah because wings. i'm looking at i'm looking yes. at like of course much more recent uh evolutionary uh what do you call it phylogeny speeding pilot whatever the thing is uh, <laughs> like okay so birds their arms turned into wings i get it you did, right. flapped yeah. around for a while and eventually got uh orca yeah that's it uh, orca whales <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they have uh their arms turned into fins okay i get that where'd the dorsal come from ah i don't know it just showed up it's possible that like these wings just showed up out of something i don't i it, well, the yeah, dorsal why wings just how? show up there's it's it's part of um <laughs> <laughs> the vertebrae have have larger arches on. There's all sorts of, anyway, but yeah. um, the yeah, it's, but it I agree with you that, that it's definitely it's a strange leap. It's very interesting. Yeah, and there are other studies that uh, look have looked at other species uh, and have suggested previously that wings may have been derived from ancestral gills. Uh, there is an evolutionary relationship between crustacean gills and the insect tracheal system. And so, but at the same time, it is, you know, why the tracheal system is more understandable because that's still yeah. related to breathing. So why, but why wings? And so, um, 
Yeah. I think they just found floppy gills and are going, hey, that looks like a wing. (laughs) I I mean, (laughs) I don't know. I'm sure that's probably not what's happening, but that's how it sounds. Well, so um, it's it's interesting because I'm I'm also now thinking about um, turtle shells Mm -hmm. and how they started out as rib bones. The the plastron, the bottom of a turtle shell, is the ribs, and the ribs um, ended up protruding out of the skin in development and creating this hardened outer it's it's this crazy kind of jump um kind of similar a more internal structure becoming more superficial and i don't know yeah, but the, the, and the, the gills the gill too, these those... gill pads and these these funk they are actually protecting they're on the outside yeah. in the uh you know the, the and, and they're kind of structured and they're yeah. structured and they're protecting yeah. the underlying breathing apparatus, the respiration mm-hmm. apparatus. And so once the organism emerges from the water and doesn't need to breathe in that way anymore, what are those external structures going to be co-opted for? Yeah, mm-hmm. but what are they going to look like? Like like a bird wing still looks like long fingers. Like is there is there something in the structure of uh gills when you put them onto a slide and look under a microscope that looks at all similar to the the design structure of a bee's wing i mean is that is the question is what does it look like in 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 development yeah because uh, it's it doesn't really matter what it looks like in the end it matters what it looks like when you look when you look inside um the the chrysalis when they're developing and you see kind of how that wing is coming into into being does it follow the process that looks similar which is the whole other weird thing about this is that these animals go through metamorphosis so it's not even like you can watch the wings happen in an egg as they develop from a ball of cells you're you're watching this happen when they become goop (laughs) but the goop knows what it wants to do next it's the goop goop knows what it wants to do next but you can't watch the goop on a mission yeah it makes it so much harder to figure out what's going on developmentally. Kind of makes this really interesting. That's such a cool process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I so feel like, I feel like I feel like that's uh, that's that's probably it. That's the that's the reason for the goop stage. The whole reason for the metamorphosis. I need to get this all the way over there and turn it into a wing. The only way we're gonna do yes. that, sir, is if you turn into goop first. Well, then sign me up. Right. Sign me up. We'll do that. We'll just Evolution do a goop stage. That's finds all. a way. Goop stage. <laughs> it totally did. Um, I can't answer right now. I'm kind of in my goop stage. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. That's what I should have put as my out of office when I was on maternity leave. I'm a little goopy I'm right now. I'm currently in my goop stage. <laughs> Wait, isn't that an effervescent candle? No, no, no. Oh, that's a different no. kind of goop. Different kind of goop. Well, I know. I'm just saying. It's not my goop. It's good. It's not. It's not. Metamorph. It's not a goop stage. Yeah, not it. Not my it's goop not is insect in a crystal, metamorphosis. Not in a candle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Man. Have we done it? I think so. We did it. We did a we whole made... show. All the way through. Thanks, everybody. Blair, I'm so excited you got to stay for the whole show. I know. I'm, wa- I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm watching the monitor. Keep, right sleep <laughs> Keep sleeping, child. Uh-huh. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Fada, thank you again for all of your help with show notes, with the YouTube description, social media. Gord, R and Laura, thank you for help in the chat room, keeping everything peaceful. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And everybody in the chat room, thank you for who watched live. Thank you for being here to watch it all live. But of course, thank you to our Twist patrons. Thank you to Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, George Corris, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vagard Chefstad, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylio, Ali Coffin, Reg and Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, PIG, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshack, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Newells, Jack, 
Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessen, Flo, Steve Leesman, A.K.A. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brennan, Minish, Johnny Gridley, Jaime Day, G. Burton, Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, jo- Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Nat, Nap. Lawn Makes, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Silmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you out there are interested in uh, supporting us and help keep the show going, uh, you can find information and become part of producing this show at twist.org. Click on the Patreon link. The next week's show, we should be we, back. Yeah, we'll be back. We, right. Well, some of us will be back. 8 p.m. <laughs> Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and our Facebook <laughs> channels and from twist.org slash live. Oh, Blair. Uh, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Uh, maybe while you uh, make a souffle. I don't know. Might be fun. Just search for This Week in Science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, links to stories and show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for newsletters. You can also contact us directly, email kiki at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the sort of line, or your email will be spam filtered into some dark energy, which, since we don't fully understand it yet, uh, we're not going to read it. (laughs) You can also hit us up on non- Right wing hellscape social media where we are at Twist Science. <laughs> we love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science. this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science This week in science, this week in science, this week in science.